I used a little bit of this time here just to kind of stay on pace or keep up on pace in terms of this chapter that we've been talking about, which is gases. And then, like I said, we'll stop and uh, obviously we'll talk about the second part of the titration experiment uh, afterwards. All right, so uh, we've been talking about sort of uh, some gas laws here. We did the last example, so why don't you take a couple minutes here and try this one. Um, an experiment has 452 milliliters of a gas. Goes from 22 to 187. Uh, what is the final volume? So take a moment and see what you come up with. Okay, uh, so let's take a look. So same approach. I'm just going to pull out the information. So I got 452 milliliters, which is obviously a volume. Um, it is heated from a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius to a temperature of 187. And I am looking for a volume. Again, looking at this should point you obviously not towards Boyle's law because obviously we have no pressures here. Uh, can't do Guy Lussac's law also so because there's no pressures. So that really should move you to Charles' law because that is again the sort of one that matches there. So a couple of things we do have to be uh, sort of concerned with. We will uh, sort of label these guys here and <clears throat> We want to uh, make sure our temperature is correct. So it is not in Kelvin, which it usually isn't, unfortunately. So we do need to do some adding here. So we're gonna add 273 uh, to each of these and that will get us into Kelvin. And it looks like in this case, we end up with uh, 295 Kelvin. And 460 Kelvin here. In this case, we are solving for V2. So again, just going to bring that guy across and up and that will rearrange it for us properly, which gives us V1, T2, T1 uh, is equal to V2 in this case. Again, putting in sort of the correct numbers in the right location, 452 should go up on top. Then T2 should go up on top, which is 460. And T1 should go there on the bottom. Kelvins are gonna cancel. In this case, it will leave us with milliliters as our units, which is okay, because that is a unit of volume. So 452 times 460 divided by a 295er, looking like we'll call it 705 milliliters questions on that calculation there. Again, understanding sort of Charles law and the relationship that we uh, should understand from it. We see here in the case of temperature, our temperature is decreasing, um, which means, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> wrong way. Our temperature is increasing. That would be more. 460 is larger than T6, 295. So uh, our temperature is increasing, which means we would expect the volume to increase. And that's actually what we see as well. We're going from uh, 452 to 705. So again, that does make sense based on sort of our understanding of the relationship uh, between volume and temperature in uh, Charles Law. Question on that there. And again, like I said, it's a good idea to kind of look at the relationship and make sure, you know, your answer does make sense. Uh, it's very common people will rearrange the equation incorrectly and sort of flip things around and, you know, have, uh, for example, the 295 up on top and the 460 on the bottom. You know, it's a very common sort of error and stuff like that. All right, let's try another one here. We've got a light bulb at 1.2 atmospheres and 18 degrees. Um, what is the pressure at 85 degrees Celsius? So take a second and see what you come up with. So looking here, uh, we got a pressure that is 1.2 atmospheres. We got a temperature that's 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, we got another temperature there at 85 degrees Celsius and we're looking for a pressure here. So again, in this case, Charles law, not going to do you much good as there's no volumes and same thing with Boyle's law as there are no volumes there. So that's not going to do you good. So that's your point you in the direction of Guy Lussac's law, which is our P1 T1 
is equal to P2 over T2. And this is obviously a constant volume in this particular case. Much like any gas law, we do need to get our temperatures into Kelvin. So we'll do our 273 addition here, giving us 358 Kelvin and a 291 Kelvin. Here we are looking for uh, P2, which means we, again, we need to move our T2 to the other side. And that gives us P1 T2 is T1 is equal to P2. Popping in our numbers in the correct spots here are 1.2 atmospheres up on top. Again, here we want T2, which should be the 358 up on top. And on the bottom there are 291 Kelvin. Again, the Kelvins will cancel. In this case, we will be left with atmospheres, which is good because that's a unit of pressure. And that's a 1.2 times 358 divided by 291. And it looks like we get a 1.48 in terms of our pressure. One point four eight is our pressure, and again, we can uh, take a look here and just to make sure that everything is correct. Here we see, if I'll do this correct this time, our temperature is going up, which means we would expect our pressure to increase. So it went from one point two to one point four eight. So again, does make sense in terms of what we know. Question on any part of that calculation there. So those are uh, some gas laws uh, dealing with uh, pressure, volume, uh, temperature sort of relationships. Another uh, important sort of gas law is our good friend Avogadro. So Avogadro, right, he had a number and he also had a gas law as well. So when we think about Avogadro, we think about Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number is the one mole of something, right, equals 6.022 times 10 to 23. And not surprisingly, Avogadro's law deals with moles. So Avogadro's law deals with the relationship between moles and volume at constant temperature and pressure. So its relationship is V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. And this is at two specific conditions, constant temperature and pressure occurring. N is actually the number of moles. So N represents number of moles, V represents volume. And the relationship that we see is uh, an interesting sort of one, sort of the volume and the moles of gas are sort of proportional to each other. And it actually can play in addition to just uh, sort of plugging and chugging into this formula where you can solve for volume, you can solve for moles and stuff like that. You can, you can also sort of tie this relationship to something like stoichiometry. <clears throat> so uh, when we look at stoichiometry, as we've been talking about, we typically look at the coefficients in a couple of ways when we're doing stoichiometry, as we talked about before, we could do it as three molecules, one molecule, two molecules, or that sort of mole to mole relationship. We can also do a volume to volume relationship when we're dealing with gases and stoichiometry and we're under a constant temperature and pressure. And it actually kind of works the same way based on sort of Avogadro's law. If we would take this equation here, we could say, just like we did, hey, there's three moles of H2 reacts with one mole of N2. We could say that there are three liters of H2. Let me try that again. Three liters of H2 uh, react with one liter of N, N2 here. And that is basically just coming from the coefficients like our mole to mole relationship. Uh, we could also say for every three liters of H2, 
we would produce two liters of NH3. Again, also from the coefficients here is where those numbers come from. We say one liter of N2 would also produce two liters of NH3. Much like a traditional stoichiometry problem, we could basically use those relationships um, as conversion factors, like three liters of H2 over one liter of N2. Our one liter of N2 is three liters of H2. So this allows us, you know, if we're, we're not necessarily given enough information, maybe to get to even moles, um, but we are given some volume information about uh, a reaction that involves gases. We could kind of use this sort of relationship, which is rooted in Avogadro's relationship, that basically the moles and the volume are sort of the same idea. Uh, they increase equally to each other, and we could kind of do that relationship again, in addition to obviously, as I mentioned, just plugging and chugging into uh, the actual Avogadro's law, which is here. So let's take a look at sort of how that one does, how that sort of would work in a sort of uh, uh, gas stoichiometry problem. It also allows you, you know, in the case you don't necessarily have to maybe use a gas law to uh, solve for something. So let's just say, for example, here, we wanna know how many volumes of NO are obtained from one volume of NH3. So basically the only information we have is basically how many volumes of NH3 and we're looking for basically how many volumes of uh, NO we could get from that. So we could use again, sort of the coefficients here and the key is this last part as well, basically constant temperature pressure tells us it's sort of Avogadro's relationship here. Um, we could say again that there are four liters of NH3. You could really use any volume unit you want, milliliters, liters, whatever it may be, uh, is equal to five liters of O2. We could also say four liters of NH3 is equal to four liters of NO. And we could go through all of them, obviously. Uh, we could say five liters of O2 is equal to four liters of NO, you know, five liters of O2 is equal to six liters of H2O. We could again do these two guys as well. Four liters of NO gives us six liters of H2O. Again, this is exactly equivalent to how we do sort of our mole to mole relationship uh, when we're dealing with uh, obviously the mole aspect of it. So for our sake of argument, we're going to figure out, you know, if we started with basically one liter of NH3, how many liters of NO would we get? So we would want obviously the relationship like we would find the mole to mole relationship between NH3 and NO, and it is this guy right here. And again, basically just doing a stoichiometry problem, we see that for every four liters of NH3, we get four liters of NO. I think I can maybe do the math here. Those guys basically cancel. And we would produce one liter of NO in this particular case. So basically we would put in a liter, we would get out a liter, put in a milliliter, get out a milliliter uh, in this particular example. You know, if we were doing it to say O2, for example, or, or if we're doing it to H2O, we would set it up a little bit different. This would be six liters of H2O to four liters of NH3. And that basically would get us six divided by four, basically one and a half liters of H2O would be produced. So we're gonna talk a little bit about gas stoichiometry later in this chapter, but uh, this is a way sort of under constant temperature and pressure you could apply Avogadro's sort of law to it and you actually can um, avoid sort of gas laws and do it more like a stoichiometry problem than sort of a gas law problem. Any questions on sort of that relationship there? Okay, so uh, these gas laws are really important that we've been talking about and sort of putting them together 
is going to get us to a really important gas law, but just a quick sort of review of some of the stuff that we've we've talked about in terms of the relationships that we see with these gas law. Obviously, we talked about Boyle's law and as the pressure increases, the volume decreases and vice versa. As the volume increases, the pressure goes down. Again, that inverse relationship, one goes up, one goes down. And again, here's a much better picture probably than what I drew. As we decrease the volume, all these gas molecules are much closer to each other, increasing the collisions, increasing the pressure. As opposed to when we increase the volume, like over here, gives everybody a little bit more room to move around. And we will start to see the pressure sort of decrease as we have less collisions basically occurring. Sort of our Charles Law or Guy Lusick sort of relationships here. Uh, we do see that as the volume um, decreases, we see that at lower temperatures that occurs again, pushing everybody near each other at those lower temperatures, because at the lower temperatures, they're moving slower, which would result in less collisions. So you're sort of forcing everybody on top of each other to keep the rate of collisions sort of up. And that's how, again, we are able to keep sort of a constant pressure. As you can see, the pressure gauge is the same all the way across. Same thing here, when we increase the volume, we need a much higher temperature that's going to allow those gas molecules to fly around a lot faster, causing the collisions to basically be maintained. And again, we see that the pressure gauge is constant all the way through that sort of situation. That is different here that when we are lowering the temperature, we do see a decrease in pressure. And we see that because here in each of these cases, the volume has not moved. It's basically a constant volume situation. So in this case, by lowering the temperature, volume not adjusting, those gas molecules are going to be flying around slower, going to be less collisions. And again, here we see the pressure gaze go down from where it started. And opposite on the other side, when the volume there is not going to move, and sort of that uh, Guy Lusick situation, we see a higher temperature is going to increase the collisions. Increasing the collisions without the adjustment of the volume shows a larger pressure occurring, as you can see, compared again to sort of the beginning part in that case. Uh, we also talked about, again, Avogadro's law, the dependence of volume and amount of gas at constant temperature and pressure. And again, at a constant uh, temperature and pressure. Basically, you can see that as the volume decreases, the gas molecules decrease from where it started. As the volume increases, so does the number of gas molecules or the moles of gas. And again, that's sort of why we could relate when we're just talking about Avogadro's law and sort of that mole to mole relationship and the volume to volume relationship. We see sort of a direct relationship between the increase in volume and the increase in the number of gas molecules needed uh, to keep the pressure constant. So if we increase the volume here and had not enough gas molecules in there, we would see a decrease in pressure. And we don't see that in this case because in the case to the right, we increase the number of gas molecules, again, keeping the collision rate constant. And when we decrease the volume, we lowered the amount of gas molecules, again, allowing the pressure to remain constant in that particular case. So these are sort of the relationships that we talked about when we talked about these sort of gas laws up to this point. And sort of putting all those gas laws together, if we combine really Boyle's law, Charles' law, Avogadro's law, and really sort of stick them all together, we do get the granddaddy of them all, which is the ideal gas law. And the ideal gas law is different than a lot of the other gas laws that we've been talking about up to this point. But first off, it is PV equals NRT. The first major difference between sort of the ideal gas law and all the others is if you think about the other ones, there's like a before and after situation occurring, you know, two pressures, two volumes, you know, two temperatures. Here in the ideal gas law is basically a sort of a one situation sort of use of it. The other really important thing is it is the most restrictive in terms of units. So when we talk about units and we specifically talk about using the ideal gas law, 
we basically have to use the units in a specific sort of fashion or the units need to be in the correct sort of fashion. First off, P, which is pressure. When you're using the ideal gas law, no matter what unit of pressure you're given, it does need to be atmospheres before you use it in the ideal gas law. Same thing with V, which is volume. It has to be in liters. N, which is moles, should obviously be in moles. And T, like everybody else, in terms of gas laws, should be in Kelvin. And really the reason for all those units and why you have to use those units has to do with R. R is the gas constant. And R has a value of 0 0.08206 and units of liters times atmosphere divided by Kelvin times mole. Some people will round this nowadays to 0 0.0821. I personally will probably use this most of the time because that's just what they beat into my head and I can't get it out. But uh, it's very common though nowadays, people will kind of round it to uh, 0 0.0821. Um, so the good news about that is this is usually a constant, it's usually a value that's given to you, which means if you're ever not sure of what units you should be using in the ideal gas law, they're all right there in this value. Uh, it's liters, atmospheres, Kelvin and mole. Again, for everything to properly cancel out. What is an ideal gas? Well, we'll talk about several things that make something an ideal gas, but a couple of really important things is under normal sort of conditions um, of pressures and temperatures and stuff like that, we usually will consider most gases to behave ideally, um, which means a couple of things. First off, it means that uh, for the most part, you could have multiple gases together and they really will not have an effect on each other in sort of an ideal situation, uh, which means you may think about, well, you have multiple gases floating around in the same container. Should they be colliding, interfering with each other and stuff like that? And under normal conditions, as we'll talk about a little bit later on this chapter as well, under normal conditions, you know, they, they really are assumed to really have no interaction with other gases. And that's sort of what makes something an ideal gas law. Uh, in addition, if a lot of things that make something an ideal gas law has to do with the volume of the gas itself and sort of an ideal situation uh, which usually is around normal sort of pressures and temperatures uh, that we deal with. Um, an ideal gas is really something where its volume of the gas itself is negligible based on the volume of the container it's in. And what that means is in comparison to the size of the container, whatever container the gas happens to be floating around in or flying around in, um, it's going to be much larger, much more um, important than the actual volume of the small gas that's moving around in that particular container. And we'll see a couple of those things in a bit. Um, and that's why a lot of problems that we deal with when they talk about the volume, they oftentimes talk about the volume of the container that it's in rather than necessarily the actual volume of the gas itself, again, because of that negligible sort of part. So the ideal gas law, again, um, one sort of situation dealing with uh, specific units. And uh, a thing that you should remember is you always have R sort of available. So even in problems where they, and very common in problems, they don't mention like, hey, this is R or something like that. Uh, you always have that number available to you, obviously to use. Now, a couple of other important sort of situations uh, that we come across with gases is this idea of what is referred to as STP. And STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. And what that means is if you're given in a problem that this is occurring at STP, standard temperature and pressure, they are actually giving you values of temperature and pressure. When we talk about the temperature at STP, that is 273 Kelvin and the pressure is one atmosphere. So when they say, hey, this is occurring at STP, uh, sometimes people are like, well, I don't have a temperature or pressure, but that's basically what it means. You could use for the temperature 273, you could also use obviously for the pressure one atmosphere. 
Now, there is a special relationship that occurs at STP conditions where one mole of any gas, when you are at STP and only at STP, one mole of any gas will have a volume of 22.414 liters. So that's a nice little conversion factor. Again, I will circle it four times there that can only be used at STP conditions. And what that will allow you to do in some cases is you may not have to even use, say the ideal gas law to solve a problem. You could use that relationship, but again, it does have to be at STP conditions. If the temperature is not 273 and the pressure is not one atmosphere, then you cannot use that conversion factor there. You do have to use uh, the ideal gas law in most cases. Um, if it is at STP, you could use the ideal gas law. Even at STP, you could put the values in for temperature and pressure of 273 and one atmosphere. You could use that conversion. They will come out the same. That is actually where the uh, gas constant comes from by rearranging the ideal gas law and solving for R and putting in our values at STP, which again would be one atmosphere, 22.4 would be the volume, one mole and 273. That again is, is really where we derive the value of the gas constant in this particular case. Any questions on that there? All right, so I'll just give one a go here. We are looking for the pressure and atmospheres under this situation. So see what you come up with. Okay, uh, let's take a look here. And again, um, we'll just pull out the information like we've done before. Uh, we are looking for a pressure, obviously, here. Uh, we got, obviously, a mole, which is 1.82. Uh, we have a volume that is 5.43 liters and a temperature that is 69.5 degrees Celsius. So just by laying out all that, you could pretty much kind of see the ideal gas law there. You could also see that you don't have two pressures, temperatures, or volumes. So none of those previous gas laws would obviously be of importance here. So if we just take our PV equals NRT, we are looking for pressure. We do have a volume, we do have N, and we do have T. Remember that we always have R, even if it's not given to us, and that is 0 0.08206. So we just really want to be very cautious of units, obviously, when we're using this. So we do see moles or moles, which is good. Volume is liters, which is good. And much like most gas problems, this is not good here in our temperature. So we do have to convert it to Kelvin here by taking 69.5 plus a 273. And that gives us a 342.5 Kelvin. Let's talk a little bit about temperature here for a second before we continue on, just to make sure I mentioned it or not. I don't think I did, but... Um, Temperature does need to be in Kelvin. And even if that's a case for any of these gas laws where maybe you're given the temperature in Celsius and you're asked to give the answer in Celsius. So sometimes when people come across problems like that, they figure, well, they gave it to me in Celsius and I need to give the answer in Celsius. I don't have to do the conversion to Kelvin when I go into the gas law. And the answer is yes, you do. Otherwise you will get a wrong answer. So. That's a very common error sometimes people will make is they'll go, well, they gave it to me in Celsius. They want the answer in Celsius. I don't really need to do that conversion. And the ask, and you really do need to do that conversion. So in a situation like that, you would need to convert it to Kelvin. You would need to put it into the gas law. And then afterwards, you would then need to convert back to um, Celsius at the end of that. So again, that's a very common thing with temperature always make sure it's in Kelvin, no matter what, especially when you're putting into it, any gas law that you come across. At this point, we pretty much got everything and it works the same way here. We're obviously going to uh, basically move this to the bottom when we take it across or divide by it. And that means that P would equal NRT divided by V. Putting in our numbers here gets us 1.82 moles, our 0.08206 liters, atmosphere, Kelvin, and mole, and our 342, I think it says, 
0.5 Kelvin. That's all going to be divided by our volume, which looks like it is 5.43 liters. In terms of units, moles will cancel, Kelvin will cancel, liters will cancel. That is going to leave us just atmospheres that's left over, which is good because that is a pressure. So that's 1.82 times 0.08206 uh, times the 342.5 divided by 5.43. Looks like a 9.42 atmospheres in this case would be our pressure. Any questions on that calculation there? All right, so uh, let's try another one here. Let's take a moment or two and calculate what is the volume that's occupied by 49.8 grams of HCl at STP conditions. Uh, hydrogen, again, is 1.008 grams per mole from the periodic table, and chlorine is our good 35.45 grams per mole. All right, take a moment or two to see what you come up with. Okay, uh, so let's take a look here. Not a lot of information coming out here, but maybe there is more than we think. Uh, what is the volume? So obviously we're looking for a volume. Uh, given by uh, grams of HCl, uh, which is 49.8 grams at STP. So remember that when it says STP, it actually does represent a temperature of 273 Kelvin and it does represent a pressure of one atmosphere. So again, we could kind of see our ideal gas law coming. We can definitely get moles from grams, right? So if we think about PV equals NRT, we do have pressure, we do have temperature, always have R, and obviously we can get moles from the grams, and we are looking for volume here. So we are going to want to use we can use the ideal gas law in this particular case. Uh, we do need to obviously convert our grams into moles. So 49.8 grams of HCl using the molar mass there from the periodic table, which looks like we're just adding those together. So that is a 1.008 plus a 35.45 gives us a 3646 grams per mole from the periodic table. That gives us 49.8 divided by 36.46. That gives us a 1.37 moles. And again, in this case, we can solve for volume, which would be NRT divided by P. That gives us our N, which is 1.37 moles, or R, 0.08206. Our temperature, which is our 273 because it's STP, and our pressure, which is one atmosphere. Atmospheres cancel, Kelvin cancel, moles that are down here cancel, and leaves us liters up on top, which is good because it is a volume we're looking at. So uh, we got something like uh, that times that times this and divided by one. gives us uh, <clears throat> so 1.37 times 0.08206 and times 273 there we go gives us about a 30.7 liters as our answer any questions first off on that calculation now you might have done it another way which if you did which is perfectly fine. The other way we could have done this is we actually could have avoided the ideal gas law altogether because we are at STP conditions. And because when we're at STP conditions, one mole of any gas will equal 22.414 liters. We actually could have just taken our moles that we calculated and use that as a conversion factor. It did 1.37 moles. One mole is 22.414 liters. 
the moles will cancel. Take 1.37 times 22.414 and punch it in correctly on the calculator. We end up with 30.7 liters. So this is what I was uh, mentioning earlier that if you happen to be at STP conditions uh, and you remember that conversion there, you could use it and you don't have to use the ideal gas law at all. The good news is if you can't remember it or you're not sure if you should use that conversion factor like on the bottom, you could see that no matter what the situation is, you could always use the ideal gas law and just put the numbers in. Uh, but remember, only at SCP conditions is this sort of conversion factor valid. And again, it gives you another option as to how to solve that problem. Any questions on that there? So that is the ideal gas law. And I think we have room for more gas laws, I'm sure. So let's talk about one that involves really changes to everybody. So changes to pressure, volume, and temperature. So if we take sort of the ideal gas law and we solve for R in two different situations, since R is a constant, these numbers equal each other which means we could set this equal to this, which is what we see down here. And in most situations, if you're dealing with a gas, if you don't open the top, usually the number of moles will remain constant because you don't let anything escape. And that then reduces down to this equation here, which is sometimes referred to as the combined gas law. And that is your P1, V1, Bt, V1, over T1 is equal to P2, V2, over T2. And in this case, pressure on either side could be any unit you want as long as they are the same. Volume on either side could be any unit you like, again, as long as they are the same. But much like all the other gas laws that we've been seeing, the temperatures do has to be in Kelvin. So this is a, a formula where you can use it to figure out, you know, what happens if you change maybe three of the variables, or you have all three variables sort of in play and happening here. You could kind of use it uh, to figure out, you know, how things are changing. So this is really the one that uh, sometimes gives people a very difficult time in terms of rearranging and solving correctly. So again, that is where we were talking about sort of our you know, crossover move can be helpful. It's a very common one that people sort of rearrange incorrectly. So why don't we try one here to make sure we can rearrange it correctly. So give it a go here. Consider a sample of oxygen at 27 degrees and 9.55 liters and a pressure of 2.97 atmospheres. What is the, when the pressure goes to 8.25 and we actually heat it up to 125 degrees Celsius, uh, what would be the new volume in that case? So see what you come up with. So we have a temperature that is 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, we have a volume that is 9.55 liters. And we actually have a pressure in this case of 2.97 atmospheres. We changed the pressure to 8.25 atmospheres. Uh, we actually changed the temperature as well to 125 degrees Celsius. And we want to know basically how our volume is going to look at that point. Again, by sort of laying it out like this, this should really point you in the direction now that we have a number of different gas laws to choose from. We obviously see that it does fit nicely our combined gas law here of everybody's involved. Much like everything else, we wanna kind of do some conversions that we need to. In this case, our pressures are okay because they're both in atmospheres. Obviously our temperatures are not, so we do need to add 273 to each of them. That gives us 27 plus 273, 300 Kelvin. 
gives us 125 plus 273, which is 398 Kelvin in this case. Again, we could uh, label these first ones as ones, these second ones as twos. And in this case, we are solving for V2, which means we basically want it by itself on one side up on top, which it already is on top, but it's not by itself. So here we need to do our crossover. We're going to bring our T2 there and our P2 would drop down there on the bottom. And again, if we do all that good stuff there, we end up with P1, V1, T2 up on top divided by T1 and bringing our P2 down would equal our V2 in this case. So again, it's really important to make sure that you can rearrange these correctly. Also, just as important, even if you do rearrange it correctly, to actually put the correct numbers in the right spot. So here is P1, uh, which means in this case, it would be 2.97. V1, which would be 9.55 liters. And in this case, T2, uh, which would be 398 Kelvin, that is going to be divided by our T1, which is 300 Kelvin, and our P2, which is 8.25 atmospheres. Atmospheres cancel, Kelvin cancel, leaves us with liters up on top, which is a volume in sort of what we're going for. That is 2.97 times 9.55 times 398 divided by 300 and divided by 8.25, looking like a 4.56 liters in this particular case there. Question on that calculation, where any numbers came from, how to rearrange. And again, obviously when we're crossing over like that, we're multiplying to T2 to both sides and dividing to P2 to both sides. Any questions on that one there? So again, uh, you do need to know these gas laws. They will not be provided for you and obviously how to rearrange them and solve for anything that is uh, sort of given to you. Any questions on that there? Okay, so I, I think this is a good stopping point here for lecture.